the screen. Okay, so this is a class in six parts. Uh, business, I cannot fulfill, you disappoint me, this is a most difficult task. Those are examples of what I will be showing you. These are all, these are all historic, these are all historic models that I've taken um, to explain the best way to write a letter of regret. <clears throat> Number one, business regrets. This part explains why a task must go un why if a task must go uncompleted or an act performed that may seem difficult or untoward or impossible. This chapter explains how to write an effective letter to that effect. Um, this is a handwritten letter circa 1840. It efficiently rescinds a request that the author, Erskine Neal, had previously made on behalf of a third party. Neal had asked a major publishing house to represent a friend of his, only to find out that the friend's character was lacking. This letter is effective because it removes Neal from professional awkwardness by admitting his mistake he does so in a forthright manner without embarrassment, and he expresses thanks in a professional manner, all very efficiently. This is one of my favorites. This is a, this is a fairly famous letter. In May of 1958, Jackie Robinson wrote this letter to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, respectfully expressing regrets that the president was not properly addressing civil rights. This letter is diagrammed in part six where I will show you the five, five most essential, most essential parts of an effective letter of regret. We'll go back to this letter later. These are two pre-printed notes of regret by George Bernard Shaw one dated February 9, 1948, and the other undated. Shaw was an outspoken Victorian-era author and playwright. Both notes express the quick wit and biting criticism for which he was well known. Unless one is a famous author, one would do well to avoid obvious sarcasm of this kind. Please be straightforward in your regrets. This is a note written by Mark Twain, circa 1884. Throughout his life, Twain had money troubles. He spoke publicly to promote his books and as a form of income. By 1885, Twain had finished a three-month national lecture tour. The now famous Adventures of Huckleberry Finn had been published and his own publishing company had printed the autobiography of Ulysses S. Grant that became a blockbuster. Between November of 1884 and February 1885, Twain and George Washington Cable, is it Cable or Cabell? Cable? Um, author of fiction about New Orleans and notable as the first Southern author, went on a tour performing over 103 times in about 80 cities. It well may be that by this time, he no longer needed speaking engagements for fame or revenue. So he's turning down a request for him to come and speak. That's what this handwritten note is about. This one's a little long. I like it for many reasons. Um, September 1814 to February 1815, James Monroe, who would become our fifth president, was the United States Secretary of War. He served as both Secretary of War and Secretary of State during the difficult time and the close of the War of 1812. <coughs> However, the peace treaty between the US and Britain took two months to get to his majesty in Britain, ending the 36 month strife. Madison's orders to Scott were to clean up the island of Tangier in Chesapeake Bay. He was writing this man to get rid of the British forces, but he had no men to offer 
He had no munitions. He had no food to offer this man. All he could do was give orders. And it's a beautifully, beautifully written letter. This is from the National Archives in DC. This is an example of a standardized rejection letter that missed its mark. This one from the city of Woodland, California, turning down an application for a license to carry a concealed weapon. The application was made by the owner of a small business who carries cash to and from his store to the bank. The chief of police must have thought this an inefficient reason, insufficient reason to carry a firearm, but failed to give justification for rejection. As a result, in a continued effort to see, seek self-protection, the applicant has since, required, in, since acquired a taser. Letters of regret, business again, including letters of resignation and termination. So this is the category, I quit, you're fired. This is a great one. I got this off of the internet, but I think this young man was brilliant. So it's a resignation cake. <laughs> Cute, right? This is an excellent example of I quit. The sender, in a unique and engaging manner, a cake, explains how much he has enjoyed his employment and his reasons for leaving. One would suspect that this letter was met with warm feelings and that his leave taking was amicable. He probably could go back and get a job anytime he wanted. This is a famous one. I also got this on the internet. It's a letter from the Museum of Modern Art to artist Andy Warhol, regretting to inform him that his gift of the drawing shoe was rejected. While polite and businesslike, the letter is lacking, in my opinion, for two reasons. It fails to explain the museum's criteria for accepting and rejecting, and it totally misses the opportunity to acquire an original Andy Warhol for free. They missed the boat. In August 8th of 1974, some in this room may remember this, I do, television broadcast to the nation and world at large, our 37th president resigned. Nixon never openly discussed his part in the Democratic National Committee headquarters break-ins and subsequent cover-ups, nor his practice of illicitly taping recording, recorded conversations in the White House. And he missed this golden opportunity to explain to the nation his actions. You can find this letter all over the internet. It's not a secret. So I kind of love this. It's like direct and to the point, I hereby resign. This is letter of resignation. I love this one. Letter of resignation from Eleanor Roosevelt to the president of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the DAR, in support of Marian Anderson, who had been refused permission to perform at Constitution Hall in Washington because despite world-renowned fame as a great artist, Anderson was African-American. And the DAR, without cause or reason, decided it's not a good idea to let her perform in their esteemed hall. This is, this is a great letter. And these, this is a letter from the president of the DAR in response. Mrs. Roberts' response to Mrs. Roosevelt that seems painfully insincere. The only remedy, remedy is really important in a letter of regret. The only remedy offered by the president of the DAR for what became a national embarrassment was Perhaps I might have been able to remove some of the misunderstanding. This action was so contentious that Mrs. Henry M. Robert Jr. refused to respond to any inquiries from the press thereafter. And to this day, it is reported that board members of the organization are tight-mouthed and made uncomfortable about any mention or inquiry of this incident. Letters of regret personal, including Dear John and those expressing regret for regrettable and socially unacceptable behavior. 
um, I'm not going to read this whole thing. Basically, this is a letter of apology by a police officer in California who shot with a pistol and killed a young African-American man. He was convicted, and he sent this letter to the public at large apologizing, but he did not apologize to the family. He did not apologize to the man who was killed son. He did it to the public at large. And I find it lacking because it seems terribly insincere. It was like a Hail Mary pass to have his sentence somewhat um, reduced. I don't think that that ploy worked. And this is a really cheeky one. This is a ready-made note card expressing regret. Similar missives were available commercially from two different society engravers, Mrs. John L. Strong, and from Dempsey and Carroll, New York City. Space is given for the author to pen their name above the engraved message, and space is provided below for any necessary elaboration. This, the Dempsey and Carroll specimen, could have been purchased to assuage the conscience of a naughty male or female guest. I've wanted to replicate this. I think that these are great. Excuses? Probably. <laughs> Probably. So on a not quite festive note, um, this used to be a, on the internet, and I can't find it anymore. But it's a letter of regret from Marilyn Monroe to Joe DiMaggio. And this letter was never sent. One of the most important qualities of all successful regret letters is honesty. Here, Monroe's heart is written plainly on her sleeve as she confesses the desire to succeed in the biggest and most difficult thing there is. Monroe was married to D DiMaggio for less than a year and the relationship is reported to have been rocky. While this example lacks thoroughness, of a complete letter of regret from this famously brilliant blonde man magnet, which she was, it's an important lesson reminding us to convey what is truly in our heart in a constructive manner to the appropriate party. And it reads, Dear Joe, if I can only succeed in making you happy, I will have succeeded in the biggest and most difficult thing there is that is to make one person completely happy. And I think she was so distraught or complicated, um, she forgot and she signed Joe's name rather than her own, which is kind of weird, but maybe she, well, she was a client of Dr. Feelgood, maybe her head was a little sideways at that point. But to me, this is a very honest and straightforward letter or gesture. So these are hard. Condolence and Bereavement Acknowledgement Letters. Um, I love this one. It's from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and it was penned in 1964. Mrs. Kennedy, this is, this is to Jackie Kennedy, um, after her husband was assassinated in 1963. I am just an old 73-year-old man who lost his wife in 1963, and I can feel the sorrow you are going through. My wife died in my arms as your husband died in your arms. When I watched you on the television as you walked behind the flag-draped coffin, I cried my eyes out. I know you received thousands of letters, but I just wanted to tell you I think you are one of the most wonderful women on earth. May God always bless you, sincerely. This is, this is an image of bereavement acknowledgement cards on top sent from Mrs. Kennedy or a member of her personal staff. Uh, I think there were six staff members on the bottom handling the 800,000 condolence letters she received within the first seven weeks following the assassination of her husband. Bereavement acknowledgments are responses to condolence notes and letters. And here's one. 
And this letter from Helen McKay <coughs> meets every level of criteria for a successful bereavement acknowledgement. And you can write this down, and we'll go over this at the end also, because there, there are commonalities between all successful letters. Number one, it identifies the parties involved by name. Number two, it specifically cites one or more act performed on behalf of the bereaved. And number three, acknowledgement of feelings such as, I needed to unburden my grief or on a dear friend. It was written in her own hand and reads as follows. Dear John and Nancy, it's difficult for me to properly thank you for the many, many kind and thoughtful things you've done since Bob's death. The sweetest caring telephone calls just when I needed to unburden my grief on a dear friend. The lovely, fragrant, pale pink roses everywhere I looked, making me feel better in spite of myself. You just seem to know what will help, and then you do it. Your care and sympathy have made my sorrow less difficult to bear, and I thank you. I shall never forget and will always love you for being so sweet. I'm looking forward to your coming on October 22nd. This is a printed bereavement acknowledgement from, again, from Mark Twain. <clears throat> in my research, and I spend a lot of time in research in uh, um, research, research institutes like the Williams Research Center. Um, this one is the property of the Harry Ransom Center in UT Austin. It's a printed bereavement acknowledgement card after the death of Samuel Cle Clemens' wife, Livy, in 1904. The very, very, very thick black border implies that the author is in deepest, meaning the earliest phase of mourning. And it's really odd that for him to have a pre-printed card because he loved stationery. Um, another pre-printed card, but with a personal note. Pre-printed bereavement acknowledgement card most likely provided by the funeral home. It's a, it's a line listed option if you go to buy funerary services. And a gracious note handwritten on the inside. This example meets the criteria for a card of its kind from a distant friend or relative. Criteria include, number one, identify the deceased by name. In this case, the name is handwritten in the space provided on the front in the top. Number two, mention the relationship between the author and the recipient, such as, I am so glad we were able to meet in January at the ball. This lends a personal connection to somebody you don't know very well. Number three, include warm gratitude for having received the condolence, such as, your kindness and words of care are so appreciated. This is, this, is, um, this is a beautiful letter, uh, 1900, from a father to his son serving in the Boer War um, in South Africa, letting him know that the family cat had passed away. This endearing letter assures that the cat suffered no pain and offers that, and, and offers that the author paid close and attentive service to the animal's last hours. I quote, I knew that he was dying but I stroked him very gently and had from him something like the ghost of a purr. On a practical level, or perhaps to soften the shock of the bad news, the father lets his son know that more books and things are on the way. Condolence and bereavement acknowledgement letters, those were what to do. Now here are examples of please do not use these. So these are from the Hallmark Card archives. Um, during the, after the Victorian era, um, the notions of death and dying changed during the Victorian era. We kind of started to soften. We talked around the subject of death and dying, and even that trend is shifting right now. Um, but there was a lot of kind of romanticizing this person and not really referring to the fact that they're 
no longer with us. So these are really hokey bad cards. I would not enjoy, I would make fun of these myself if I received them. But then I'm a promoter of handwriting notes and letters. So this is the payoff and I'm sure we have, I'm gonna share with you one more thing afterwards because it's brand new and it's great. So this is a successful, robust letter of regret. And this is the, um, this is the Jackie Robinson. Um, you all know who Jackie Robinson was? Okay. So elements of an effectively written letter of regret by Jackie Robinson to President Eisenhower, pointing out that the president may not be doing his job. <sighs> Number one. Identify the incident where you noticed the omission act or error. Number two, explain why the omission act or error is unacceptable and to whom. It is best to make the explanation as impersonal as possible, okay? Because this is a business, you know, business is different, business is different. Uh, number three, Identify yourself and your relationship to the situation. So you may, number four, respectfully suggest a constructive remedy. This is really important for all letters of regret. The reason that you're writing is because you're suggesting a remedy to the unjust act. Number five, restate why it's important and for whom and if appropriate, offer to help in the, in the endeavor or the remedy. So that, that you know, you, you, you have part of this remedy, which is pretty cool. Okay, that's it for the formal. So bear with me because I think I still have some time, yes? I do, okay, so hold on a minute. going off script a little bit because I have a little bit of time. I won't bore you. Can you hear me? Okay, so I seem to have become quite an expert in letters of regret. I also, <clears throat> in addition to my professional career as a hand and grape stationer, at which I make money, um, I run Letters read tomorrow at one o'clock at La Petite Theater. There is a letters read reading, uh, letters of Tennessee Williams to James Laughlin. Um, last year, a letters read was an open call for submission locally for letters of regret. So I seem to have cornered the market on successful and unsuccessful letters of regret. So I want to share with you a brand new, excellent remedy. <clears throat> On Monday, just a couple of days ago, the advocate advertised, advertised my letters read reading at La Petite Theater. However, it was brought to my attention late on Monday that they advertised the wrong day. In the Advocate and on the internet, it said that letters read, letters of Tennessee Williams to James Laughlin was on Saturday. Oops. I was and am grateful that when I brought the incident to the attention of the Advocate, I received a series really rapidly, oops, offering a remedy. That is, they are printing or printed 
this correction and they put it up on the internet. I could ask for nothing more. Don't you think that that's kind of great? So that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, there are questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. In person, I in, I'm going to be 64 this year. I tend I tend to use the word death or dying. I don't know why. Passing, loss. I don't think that there is a good word, frankly. Not one. Does that help? I think it's more how you feel about it. That's my general recommendation, because this is from you, and whatever your comfort level is, that's what this is all about. Does that help? And then there was one... Oh, I don't know. That's an excellent question. Do you know? Really? The only thing that I do, it was interesting, I was trying to find out why Jackie Robinson was writing on Chalk Full of Nuts um, letterhead. He did. And it was, he was on the board, I believe. But it was kind of interesting, the timing was interesting, because that's a famous old New York City commodities, you know, it's like one of our coffee companies here. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Oh. There you go. Any other questions? You're supposed to. You're actually supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, because letters, I was reminded by an attorney, locally I think, that a lot of people have fallen out of the habit of writing personal notes and letters because at this point it feels like such an obligatory burden and to take that onus off if you think about letters as a conversation so you don't have to pack it full of everything you're feeling or thinking. So it's think, think of all communication as a conversation. Is it sooner rather than later? It, everybody has a different opinion. I think that it's, okay, so the thing, it's my mother's family is in the funeral business in Detroit, and they have been for, I think it's four generations now. So I know a little bit about this, and I've looked into it because I'm a widow. Um, it is my understanding, well, in the Victorian era, I like the way the Victorians dealt and pre. Um, widow's weeds, you've heard about that, where women were covered. It's because it was to take, I wish we could do it today, it was to take the bereaved out of society. They were actually taken, so they're not expected to respond in a normal fashion. Um, I remember a book, I'm going to say within a year, the same way a thank you note for a wedding gift you have a year. So let's give the bereaved a year. Yes.
Well, okay, then um, may I ask? I am asking. Um, you didn't have any negative thoughts? It was really offering you something. Yeah. I think it's, it's the personal. The more personal you can make these things, the more effective they are. Yes. That's a great thought. Yes. I think you're right. I really like that. Thank you for pointing that out. Because, oh, well, here's another notion. Um, I don't always follow this, but I should. It's write a rough draft just to get it out of your head and then put it aside. And maybe not even look at it when you go back to it. Um, and it's fine. Of course, I love it if you use my stationery so that you go through a lot of it and tear up the rough drafts. But, yeah, just to try several times to see how you feel and is it effectively conveying all of those things that are in your head. I'm thinking. It, that's, a compli that's a complicated one. Again, it is what's in your heart. And you could send a fast one just to acknowledge. And, oh, okay, here's, okay, so a uh, friend and client. Her 98-year-old mother passed away. I just picked up the phone and got her. And I said, I'm just giving you a hug. I'm not going to. Oh, actually, I do this. I'm giving you a hug over the phone. I'm not going to take up your time right now. And then process what it is I'm going to sit down and write. Because we do have these options now. Does that help? Anybody else? Yes. Oh, one of my biggest bugaboos, thank you for bringing that up, is the online guest books that I think, I think all funeral homes now offer. You can do it all, and I, I just, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like it. Well, I'll give you one, one more, and then um, I believe that when people receive a letter from somebody they know, you know the front of a letter is called a face? It is the same response as seeing that person in person. Because usually, if you don't recognize the handwriting automatically, you almost always turn it over to see who it was sent from. So when you receive a personal note or letter, it is the same thing as shaking the hand of somebody you know very well. So that's why I am still a huge promoter of the handwritten note or letter. Thank you all for coming this morning. Oh, and you can, you can, I, you can buy my book, it's right outside.